Welcome back dividend growth investors. Today is another opportunity to discuss with you an undervalued dividend growth stock. And if you look at this chart, I mean, I like chart porn and this is definitely one of those where you can really see that since 1986, this company has been growing its dividend all the way up to now where it's paying $4.80 in dividends on an annual basis. Their dividend growth track record has been really, really amazing. And as you can see, even during the great financial recession and the pandemic, it has been able to grow its dividend quite significantly. So let's start introducing this stock because I think some of you might know already about which stock I will be talking and it is T. Rowe Price Group. If you're not familiar with this company, it's an American company focused on the investment industry. It effectively provides mutual funds that you can invest in, for instance, to save for retirement. It also has some ETFs and you can see that here when you go to their website, you can find actually all the kinds of type of mutual funds and ETFs that you might be interested in. And as you can see, many of these funds have really high Morningstar ratings because it is really a high performing company compared to BlackRock and also Vanguard. I wouldn't be able to say which the best one because I think they're all three really, really good. But I can say that, for instance, Tiro Price Group focuses more on mutual fund investing. And that's also what you can see here in the expense ratio. Because as an example, when you invest in ETFs from Vanguard, you're used to really low expense ratios. This is not the case, for instance, for T. Rowe Price, if you look at the mutual fund list. So having an expense ratio of 1.5, 0.8, 1.10 is, is quite, uh, quite common here in T. Rowe Price Group. But that's also why these uh, mutual funds are typically packaged via retirement deals and such. So I, I think it's good to know that. But this is also a much more profitable business than, for instance, when you think about Vanguard with really low expense ratios. But we'll see later also a little bit uh, that it also has as a cost and I will show you that later when we are looking at for instance a little bit of the earnings and the net income statement. So this is what the price is. It, it's really proud on itself because it also shows here and it tells us that more than 17 equity funds have bet the benchmarks most of the time. Um, I don't know if this is really true. I haven't uh, done my whole due diligence here. So this is something if you doubt about it you should really uh, further validate but I have no reason why not to believe them? Because having studied this company, it is really an investor friendly company, a no bullshit company that actually uh, builds a lot of trust with me, I must say. But it also wins a lot of prizes because, for instance, now again, it received 24 awards for fund performance. And this is really, really um, a lot. And I also could see a little list here on, uh, for instance, in Wikipedia, where in 2017 it was ranked one of the most admired companies. Well, I think for a T. Rowe Price Group, which outside of the dividend growth investing community and outside of America is not really known, is really, really a good deal. And what I really loved is also that in 2016, they won the prize for top companies for women technologists. And this is really something as well that I think is really good. And what they usually say is that women make better investors. So, you know, having, for instance, technologists or IT professionals, female IT professionals in such a company, I'm a big fan of those. And I would like to see more of that also in the companies where I worked or where I currently work. So, you know, this looks like a pretty well managed company, I must say, also when you look at all the track record and all the studies that I've done here. But that's why it's also important to be aware that, that there is a new incoming board member called Rob Sharps, SEO. Um, from what I've understood is that he has already 24 years of experience in this company. So he seems to know the company inside out, which I'm a big fan of when we talk about this. Time will tell if this is a CEO that can also lead a company. I don't know how well articulated this on investor relation calls and such. Um, he didn't disappoint me, let's say, when I listened a bit into, into one of the most recent ones. So, so far, he seems to be having a good start, but he will still have a lot of time to prove his capabilities to us. Now, now that we know that Tiro Price Group mainly earns it money via the funds it sells, and that is something that we call asset under management and the fees they take in on that, it is also important to know that if you analyze such a company, that one of the most utmost important things is really their assets and the management and the growth of it. And they have even listed it at its biggest risk in their annual report. So here it is. Early revenues are based on market value and composition of the assets under management, which are subject to fluctuation caused by factors outside of our control. 
This, I think, is really important because what they are effectively saying here is that a lot is being based on investment performance, although I don't think this is really, really the most important one because I believe they are really doing well, but mainly general financial market declines. So what happens, you know, when there's a market decline, people pull out their money. They are afraid that they will lose more money. When they pull out money, there's less assets under management for this company, which pays their fees. So this is really, I think, one of the biggest risks for a company like T. Rowe Price Group. And this is no other than, for instance, BlackRock. And the company is laser focused on this and you see it all over through the annual report. For instance, if you go to the shareholder letter and you look at uh, one of the first big sections, which is the financial results, you can already see here that the e equity market appreciation was the primary driver of assets under management. So it was not necessarily new investment products being launched for them. It was not necessarily yet an acquisition, which will come in the books in 2022 after their acquisition of Oak Hill Advisors for, what was it, 4.5 billion. I believe uh, I saw somewhere. So their performance last year was preliminary just driven on an increasing, let's say, S&P 500. This make, makes the, their business also really, really uh, subject to external factors. And I actually treat it a little bit like an oil uh, company. If the oil price goes up, Typically, the shares, share prices go up of the oil, oil majors like uh, ExxonMobil and Shell. And when the, share, when the price of oil goes down, you see that back in the share price. This, I believe, is no different for a company like T. Rowe Price. And, you know, that's also why they are reporting on it on a monthly basis. And you can see here already, like how asset under management has been performing since the end of the year. And we know that the stock market declined, right? So it went, therefore, asset under management went from 1.7 billion to 1.5 billion right now. And we have seen this also when we look at the S&P 500 during February, it went also down. I expect this to go up again because on the end of March, the stock market started to increase a little bit again. Now, if we then also look at it from a earnings report, what they mentioned, you can see it here as well. Again, assets under management, you see US mutual funds, funds in separate accounts and such. It's all being analyzed and presented laser focused back to us as investor. So if we plot all this into the uh, uh, history, you can see here that in 2005, this company had 270 billion in assets under management all the way to one and a half billion now. And what you can see here, we know the Great Financial Depression in 2008, it went from 400 billion to 276 billion. This is a major decline, right? So this also means that this stock, although it looks really safe from the dividend profile that I just showed you, is not for the lighthearted because going from this to this is a, like a 30-40% reduction and you really need to be able to stomach that because the share price will respond to that. Though if you look at it from a pandemic point of view, assets under management just blew up and we have all seen what happened to the stock market uh, during that year. A lot of money printing, even the form of UBI in America has really inflated the stock market and we see that this was really good for T. Rowe price. So if we then look at the, the long-term share price uh, development, you can see here in August 2008, on the brink of the Great Financial Recession, the company was trading at around $60 per share. Then it went all the way in February 2009 to a low of $22.5 per share. You know, this is almost, what is it, a 60% decline. Can you stomach this? This is really important for you to know if you want to own shares in this company. And we've seen it here as well, right? At the end of 2021, August, and then in October, it was still trading around $216 and now $150. If you're sensitive to price fluctuation, this might not be the stock for you because this happened more often. Also at the beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic, $133 to $97. Actually, if you look at this and you expect, for instance, a big recession coming up, I don't think we have seen a bottom here at 150. I think it can easily go to 100 and maybe even to 75 if we take, you know, the uh, the the stock price as a as an indication. And you know, if it goes back to 100, we're talking here about a 50% stock price drop since the end of last year. It already did it with about 25%. So I hope that you didn't step in here if you own some already. On the other end, if you found if you found yourself comfortable owning some shares 
at this price, then I guess with the dividend yield, you will find yourselves even more comfortable right here. So for me, this is really all what I want to say here from a risk point of view. And that's more related to the share price based on my analysis, much like an oil and gas company, I would say. On the other end, I'm actually becoming quite a fan of this company because I don't care so much about the share price. One of the things I just love about this company is their balance sheet. Look at this. Cash and cash, cash equivalents, 1.5 billion, yeah? which is approximately, let's say, 8% of their entire balance sheet. Goodwill has heavily increased because of the Oak Hill acquisition in December last year. So that's why the balance sheet also increased a little bit. But from an asset point of view, it's now 12 and a half billion. Let's look at the liabilities then. Just 2.2 billion. This company has no debt. I mean, yes, I count operating lease liabilities as long-term debt, but 249 million. What are we talking about? This company is effectively debt-free. How many companies do you know like this? Maybe Microsoft, but it already started to take on debt. I don't know many companies. And this is important because if there would be a, st a really strong market crash, this company has what they call, <laughs> it's a funny term, balance sheet optionality. It can go so many directions. Yeah, so I think this is really, really good to know. And this is what I love about this balance sheet. Look here, retained earnings, 8 billion. Stockholder equity, 9.2 billion. Yeah, and just the retained earnings uh, here is like went up with 1 billion. This is like from the bottom of the net income statement directly going to the balance sheet. Yeah, so this is like pure profit going in here. They didn't need to pay any debt back because they don't have debt. So from this point of view, this company is really a compounder in profits. And this is just what I love about this company. There is one thing, though, that I want you to be aware of, because in the investment community, people love their buybacks. There are so many people that are really appreciating the company because, wow, they've been build, buying back. I believe if I go to the uh, cash flow statement, we can see it here. They have been buying back 1.1 billion in, in shares this year and 1.2 billion before. So people say like this, like 2.5%, 3% of their share count. But here you need to just be aware of one little thing that if you dive deeper into it, this company has really large expenses and a lot of this goes to their employees. So if you look at it, 1.2 billion uh, um, shares issued, 1.4 billion again also here so we're talking about typical share uh, employee compensation of 2.5 billion which is half of their um, shares repurchased they also issued some uh, shares for the acquisitions for oak hill capital i believe so the share count has been growing actually because of this i just want you to be aware of this because this is then 2020 right to 2021 you see the same here you can also see here shares issued upon option exercises, 2.9 billion. Again, restricted stock units, 1.2 billion. This is already 4.1 billion for, uh, compared to the 6.9 billion in, in, in share repurchases. So this company is actually just buying back shares mainly to avoid dilution um, by employees' uh, stock option plans. Not a lot of this goes to the bottom line for the, uh, how you say it, for the, for the shareholder. Although over the years, the company has been able to, you know, reduce its share count from, I believe, 260 million in 10 years ago to 229 million right now, which is a reduction of 12% or something like that. So you could also say 1% per year versus 2.5% buyback yield. So now that we know all of this, I would love to go to my own dashboard because my dashboard tells me effectively whether one, the dividend is safe and two whether now is the right time to buy some shares in this company based on my fair value assessment so if we look at the dividend safety this is one of the safest dividends that i have currently in my dashboard available here of course johnson johnson is also really high microsoft but t Rowe price group quite surprised me because i haven't really looked into this company before but if you look at the eps growth over the last five years is 22 percent don't look at the free cash flow growth it had like one year or two years with hardly any free cash flow um so i would like to ignore this number here there was by the way nothing wrong in there it looked quite good and quite natural but then also from a balance sheet point of view an a plus credit rating 
debt to equity almost nothing interest coverage i just put it on 100 because it doesn't pay interest uh, and i wanted to get the full scores for that so i need to fix my dashboard here also from a payout ratio point of view we're talking about 34 to 40 percent uh, payout this means that the company can effectively lose half of its profit and still pay out and we have seen after 36 years this company has been really really committed to the dividends and we have seen that also in 2008 and 2009 where it was still able to grow its dividends over the last five years that is a dividend growth record of 17 percent this is really really insane and it has been non-stop growing its dividend since 1986 when it had its ipo i believe that the company's growth prospects because of their high quality uh, business is still strong it's maybe not very strong but it's strong enough to continue to grow so i have no doubt about this company that it will do better 10 years from now than it is doing today having said that before we quickly go to my fair valuation i would also like to show you here that i believe here if we look at it and i'm not a technical analyst that it touched the bottom like one two weeks ago at the uh, pull back a little bit from there again but like i mentioned before it can go much lower uh, if there comes a further pressure on the stock market for instance because of increasing interest rates um, what is important here also to call out is that their earnings per share are the most reliable compared to their cash flow um, that's why i'm also soon calculating with net income as a guidance for the uh, uh, fair value assessment of the company versus free cash flow like insurance companies also other financial companies uh, as the row price group are typically better valued using net income last but not least if you look at how they've been allocating their cash you can see it here dividends and always they have been buying back shares and they effectively just need to because they are not expensing their stock option plans for their employees and from a debt point of view i mean this company has just been growing it has been mainly growing its equities to shareholders and as buffett says return on equity is one of the most important metrics well i can tell you this looks really good here okay so then if we look at uh, my further analysis we can see the dividend growth here since 2012 it has been compounding like an idiot it's like three and a half times more paying a dividend than in 2012 what i also find important is to show you the revenue it went from 3 billion to what 7.6 billion in a 10 year time horizon uh, and here you see by the way the share count from 261 to 229 so it's not as much as it could have been with with better um, uh, stock-based compensation although such a company depends a lot on it because you want to have the best mutual fund managers um, what I also really love about this company, by the way, is that its gross margin has been flat effect effectively over the last decade. So it just tells you that this company has a lot of pricing power. There are not so many companies that I know with such a gross margin. I know that uh, Visa has 80 and something like that, but this is like a, a, a SaaS company, a cloud-based stock company. Amazing. Last but not least, the key statistics. I think this is the only stock that I've seen so far in my dashboard that has everything on green. The dividend yield I find really attractive right now with a 3.1% dividend yield, a chowder rule of 20 EPS, I mentioned already, low payout ratios here, but then the price to earnings is really low. And I believe this says something because the company or the market, let's say, is probably expecting a further recession coming which will then dampen the earnings of this company. And that's why it's probably pricing the company from a multiple basis uh, point of view very low, in my opinion. Last but not least, if you look at value creation for the shareholder, you want the company actually to earn more on its investments than their investments cost. And that's what we call here the weighted average cost of capital, which is high for a company like Tiro Price. It's around 9%. Why is that? It has no debt. This 9% comes mainly therefore from the expectation from the stock market. If you would have mixed it in with debt, the cost of equity would be lower. That's usually like kind of awkward when you're looking at high quality companies with a low debt profile that sometimes they get punished for that in the in the net present value calculation because of really high cost of capital which is mainly derived on market expectations so but still the return on invested capital is 26 percent higher than the cost of um, uh, capital which is really amazing so having said that i'm really bullish on this company as you can hear let's have a look at my fair value estimation so I have modeled this company with the five-year average net income of 2.184 billion. 
I believe that this is very conservative because if I would take the net income here as an example, you can see that last year they had a really, really, really good year because they had 3 billion in net income and in 2020 at 2.3 billion in net income. So it's more aligned to the 2019 numbers. Why I'm having this? Why am I so conservative? I also believe that last year was an exceptional year. Also, if you look at the earnings forecast for from the analyst, it is rather around the 2.3, 2.4 billion. I also think that the interest rate environment will put pressure on the stock market. So I really want to be in on the conservative side. And if I want to be at the conservative side, I usually take the five year average. But therefore I am less conservative also in the growth rate. I believe then that it can grow 7% annually over the next five years and 4% thereafter, we can see it has been growing much, much harder over the last uh, five year uh, alone. So I think this is still really on the conservative side, but I also believe that we have seen one of the strongest bull markets ever. And I also believe that the S&P 500 from a historical point of view is heavily overvalued. So I don't think that we can take the last five years as a guidance for the upcoming five years going forward. If we then take a discount rate of 10% and a terminal multiple of 15, which is more than the uh, 12 it currently has on a forward basis, I believe this company has a fair value per share of $173. When I'm optimistic, I take 8% and 5%, bearish 5% and 3% growth rates. All in all, the fair value of T row price, in my opinion, is $172. I believe I'm really on the conservative side. So if you model with a bit with it further, it will probably go towards 180, 190 or 200. Even though I believe that the shares are currently 12.5% undervalued. And that's why I will consider buying some shares in T-Row price and initiating for the first time a position in this company in the upcoming week. So having said that, you know now what I believe this company is worth from a share price point of view. You can also see that I believe that this is one of the safest dividends that the stock market offers us at the moment, at least in the top 10%, uh, I would say. But hey, if you're new to this channel and you would like to see more of this, check the video on the left, how you can see how I value a company. I go a little bit more in depth in that and check a video on the right, which is one of my other last videos that I think is uh, worth considering for you to, to give the look. Having said that, Dividend Growth Investors, have a great weekend and see you next week again. Cheers.